So hello, hello everyone. My name is um, Ricardo, and today I will be presenting uh, problem two of the International Mathematical Olympiad in 1992. Uh, so the problem goes as follows: um, Let R denote the set of all real numbers, and then find all functions f from R to R such that this given functional equation holds for all x and y in R. So um, we can already see that f of x is equal to x um, would be such a solution. Uh, basically, if we ignore all the f's, the equation still holds. And um, if we try f of x is some constant function, uh, then it doesn't work. So um, because the right-hand side is not constant, but the left-hand side is, so it doesn't work. OK, um, so the most basic way to approach any functional equation is just by substituting. So um, what can you substitute? You can substitute constants, for example, zero or plus minus one. You can substitute expressions in the given variables. So in our case, x and y, and possibly involving f, so two uh, x or f of x times y. And you can also, for example, swap the variables. Um, but important is you shouldn't randomly um, substitute the expressions. There should always be a motivation, for example, um, some cancellation or you count something twice. Okay, um, but what you can always do is substitute zero because if you substitute zero, stuff is bound to cancel. So um, in our case, if we set both variables to be zero, then we get an equation between two constants, which does not look very useful. Um, if we sub set y to be zero, we get this equation, which might be useful in future. Um, but um, if you substitute x for z uh, zero for x, then we get this. And this will, in fact, be useful. But why? First, I have to introduce you to injectivity and surjectivity. So I'm pretty sure you all know what injectivity and surjectivity means. So just a quick recap. Injectivity means that for each value in the domain, there is at most one corresponding value in no, sorry, the other way around. For each value in the range, there is at most one corresponding value in the domain. And surjectivity means that um, the codomain is equal to the range. So how do we prove injectivity for functional equations? Um, well, first we let A and B be in the domain such that F of A is equal to F of B. And then we try to prove that A is equal to B. So it, then how does this prove injectivity? Well, if we assume that two different values in the range would lead to the same value in the, oh, sorry, two, two different values in the domain which would lead to the same value in the range, well, then these two values would have to be equal, but that's a contradiction. So this does prove injectivity. And well, how do we prove that um, for functional equations? So. The idea is that you look for a variable which only appears as f of that variable and outside of anything relating f's, uh, the, func uh, the function, because if you imagine, if you plug in a, uh, a for that uh, variable and b separately for that, value, uh, for that variable, we get two equations where the f of y will be the same in both equations everywhere because we had f of a is equal to f of b and the only thing that differs is then the y which was outside of any function. So this will then lead to a, uh, to a being equal to b. Um, so in our case, if we set y to be equal to a and y to be equal to b, um, the, right -hand si the left-hand sides are equal, so we can um, set the right-hand sides to be equal, and then we cancel. Therefore, a is in fact be equal to b, so we've proven that the function is injective. And how about surjectivity? Well, this is a bit simpler to prove, um, namely, or yes, namely just we have to reduce to an equation where we on one side we have f of something and on the other side we have uh, just a surjective expression. And well, how does this prove that f is surjective? Well, if the right hand side is surjective, then the left hand side also has to be surjective. So f is surjective. And in our case, if we go back to our substitutions and we look at x is equal to zero, well, this looks promising because on the left-hand side, we have um, 
the left hand side is of the form of f of something and the right hand side is a surjective expression because each real number can be written as a constant plus another real number. So now we've proven that f is injective and surjective, so f is bijective. So now the next step is, um, you see that on the left hand side we have an x squared, but squares don't care about signs. So maybe if we plug in minus x for x, this x squared will be the same, so maybe we can deduce something from that. Um, but first I'll introduce you to even and odd functions. So uh, there, even an even function is just a function where f of minus x is equal to f of x. And you can imagine that by uh, simply the graph of f is, um, re has reflectional symmetry at the y-axis. And some examples for that would be um, x to an even power or cosine of x. And um, in that case, um, odd, odd functions are the opposite. So where f of minus x is equal to minus f of x and how can you imagine that? Well, basically, um, the graph of f has point symmetry at the origin, and examples for that would be uh, x to some odd power or sine of x. Um, so now if we go back and substitute x uh, minus x for x, the left-hand side stays the same. So we can equate the two right-hand sides, and then we cancel the y. We take the square roots, but don't forget the plus, minus, uh, plus and minus. So uh, now we get this equation. And this looks already suspiciously like even or odd. Um, and if we just, think back- Just one oh, moment, Ricardo. So you're saying for every x, you have this equation where a priori yes. the plus or minus sign can depend on x. Yes, sorry. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay. Um, so uh, we get redu reduced to this equation. But if we remember back, we've proven injectivity so um, if f of minus x is equal to f of x for some x in R, then that would mean that minus x is equal to x because of injectivity. And that would lead to a contradiction um, unless x is equal to zero. But that means that f of minus x is equal to minus f of x, the other case, for all x uh, non-zero in R. So we can write that down. Um, so now in the next step, since we've proven that f is bijec uh, surjective, then f must have a root. Then let's see, we assume that c is not zero in R uh, b the root of f. And then um, since f is odd um, and, c is not um, and c is not zero, we can uh, say that uh, f of c is equal to minus f of minus c. But uh, since it is zero, we can ignore the minus in front of the, in front of the f. But now we know that f of c is equal to f of minus c, but that yields a contradiction by either injectivity, and this is not true for um, c not being equal to zero, or we've proven that f is odd for c not being equal to zero. So, in both, uh, so this cannot be true. And therefore, c not equal to zero cannot be a root of f. So therefore, the only root left is zero. So. Um, in other words, f of zero is equal to zero. So we can write this down as well. Um, so now if we go back to our substitutions that we had and we plug in zero for f of zero, well, the first one is just trivial. And um, the, other, the, the other two equations um, might come in handy later on. So now we can, uh, yes, we write these down as well. So now we can, play around a bit with the equation. So maybe we said y to be equal to x or, well, then then we get this equation or we said, and then, sorry, and then we can take the squares inside because of the equation that we've proven before. Or we can substitute y for the square of f of x and then um, we get this equation, which already looks very complicated. We can take the squares inside, but um, this still does not look very useful. And why they're not useful? Well, we, we don't have very much flexibility because uh, we only have one variable. So we cannot really achieve any, uh, anything from these. But um, if we look back to what we've proven, these two equations, 
one of them already appears in our original equation. And maybe if we can make the other one appear as well, we can deduce something useful from that. So um, how do we get that this appears somewhere here? We already have an f of y. We only need an f of f of y. So we set y to be f of y. Um, and um, we recognize this f of f of y. So we just plug in y. We use both equations. And then we get this. And this might not look incredibly useful, but it will be after I introduce uh, the, um, so we write this down as well. And this will be useful because of the Cauchy equation. So the theorem of the Cauchy equation goes as follows. Um, if you have a function from R to R, such that f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y, then either f, um, is, f of x is equal to cx for some c in R, or the graph of f is dense in R squared. Um, what dense means is not important for the moment, so we'll um, tell you that later. Because first we have to get to this equation. Our equation, the, the equation that we got does not quite look like that one yet, but we can fix that, namely by multiplying by minus one. Since the function is odd, we can take the minuses inside. And now we realize that y ranges in r. So minus y also ranges in r. And this x squared ranges in r plus, and this minus x squared ranges in r minus. So in general, we have, if, um, we have these two variables, which one of them ranges in um, R and the other one also ranges in R. So basically, in other words, we have, this is true for all X and Y in R. And um, now this is useful because we can now use the, the Cauchy equation. If we can disprove the second bullet point, we, we know the first bullet point. So, uh, so now, what does density mean? Well, density is a, is a weird property. It means that uh, if the graph of F is dense, then if we look at the plane, then for any arbitrarily small circle in the plane, one point, at, at least one point of that graph is in the circle. And um, well, this is very complicated and you cannot really imagine such a dense graph, but we don't have to worry about that because the only thing that we have to do is we have to disprove that our graph is all, or our the graph of our function is dense. Well, how do we do that? We can, for example, prove that f is continuous or that f is monotonic or that f is bounded on some non-zero interval. Well, how does that prove density? Well, we can imagine that for all of these uh, cases, we can place a circle somewhere in the plane such that our graph it, such that our graph does not intersect for example this circle so um in all of these cases they are not dense so um for our functional equation if we look at this equation here basically what this this equation tells us if is that this is x squared this x squared ranges in r so f of anything positive since on the right hand side we have a square then f of anything positive has to be positive. But that means that our graph lies entirely in the, f in the first quadrant. And um, because the function is odd, that also implies that um, the other part, the other half of the graph lies in the third quadrant. So this, um, this uh, or in other words, f of x is st strictly greater than zero for x being strictly greater than zero and so on, um, because f of zero is zero. So this is right in the middle. And well, that implies that the graph of F is not dense. But if we look at the Cauchy equation, this means that the second bullet point is not true. Therefore, the first bullet point has to be true. And therefore, uh, just finishing the proof, now we assume that F of X is equal to CX for so some C not equal to zero in R because if C was zero, then F of X is just e equal to zero. And um, now, if we plug that in, we get cx squared plus c squared y is equal to y plus c squared x squared. But um, the corresponding coefficients have to match because if we, um, if we for example, substitute y uh, is uh, zero for y, this equation still has to be true. But then cx squared is equal to c squared x squared, but 
this implies that c is equal to one. So um, now we get um, up here, if we set c to be one, we get f of x is equal to x, which was uh, what we had in the very beginning, what we looked at in the very beginning. And if we plug it in, in here, again, this is true. So um, this is the end of the proof. Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah. Sorry, so what you say is that the only function satisfying this property is the identity? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, more, more questions? Just maybe wondering, you're used to solving functional equations, I guess. Is this the yes. classic steps you take every time? Um, well, sort of. Wait, um, maybe we can. Um, yes, well, you always start by substituting. And then, yes, injectivity and surjectivity is also a thing that you um, generally look at. Um, there are other tricks that you can also use. Um, for example, fixed points or mm -hmm. trying to equate different arguments. But um, these are generally some steps like, yeah, this, this is what the general functional equation or the solution would look like.